All right, Mike, with that's good enough for me.com, we're doing our Who's Zoom and Who series. I'm here with Ludwig Gurr, the director of Pretending I'm a Superman, the Tony Hawk Pro Skater documentary that just came out. How are you doing? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Fantastic. I got off work uh, a couple seconds ago. Uh, my daughter's watching the worst fucking thing in the entire world right now. It is, um, she's watching YouTube videos of another girl playing with Anna and Elsa dolls from Frozen and oh. making them talk to each other. So while I'm working from home, I'm listening to another kid play with their dolls. That's not yeah. nice. <laughs> so, uh, I guess my first question that I had for you uh, is, you know, did this quarantine, did COVID affect uh, the the process of the documentary or, or in some ways did it speed up the process since uh, everybody had something to work on? You know, I mean, the film was pretty much finished by the time COVID arrived. You know, it actually premiered at a festival February 28th, which is just a few days before lockdown in LA and all that stuff. Uh, I'd say it definitely made it a bit worse for us because we were actually going to do a, you know, we were hoping to do a pretty big theatrical release. And we had a lot of things planned for that. And obviously that whole thing got canceled, you know, because of COVID. So, yeah, that, that was a bit unfortunate. But I don't think, you know, our release went bad in any way. You know, it, it's been pretty good. It's, it's been real fun. It's, you know, reached like the number two spots on iTunes, stuff like that. But you know, COVID definitely, it had an effect on the release for sure, man. Yeah. Well, I was, I was happy when it came out. Yeah, I noticed, I, I wrote this down because it's so stupid. Uh, Fantastic Fungi was the, the movie that beat your documentary on. <laughs> what was on that? Fantastic. Yeah, Fantastic right. Fantastic Fungi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. I saw that. I have to see it now, you know, yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see how, how Fungus is somehow more interesting than one yeah. of the the best video games that was ever made mm -hmm. <laughs> uh and i wanted to compliment you on the on the release i i, I fully enjoyed watching it thank you uh, i'm i have two left feet so i've never skateboarded a day in my life but i've been a fan of the of the culture and, and the punk rock element of it the music for quite some time uh, i like video games yeah. but uh i wanted to applaud you for making it so skater forward uh, that, that's really what I took away from it. Uh, it, it reminded me of the, the skater VHSs that I was, you know, attaining in the nineties. Uh, and this comes from a person that's watched a lot of video game documentaries, you know, that's awesome, man. That's so good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wanted to kind of talk about, I don't know how old you are, but I, I'm 36. So when, but one giant impact I think that Tony Hawk Pro Skater had uh, that a lot of the skaters in the film kind of joked about, uh, and you broke it into decades uh, on the documentary, which I think was really clever, uh, breaking down just the, the stylistic changes that were happening from uh, street skating, uh, replacing vert ramps of the 80s, for example. When Tony Hawk Pro Skater came out, for me, as a non-skater, uh, that thought skating was cool. Uh, I was kind of left under the impression for a very long time that every, every step of skating existed all at the same time. They had always been there, that there were people doing manuals, doing vert ramps, uh, doing street skating all at the same time. Uh, would you like to kind of elaborate on how you broke it apart on your film uh, and how that might have affected your learning of the process as well? What kind of learning process? Sorry, I don't think I really... Just, just, uh, yeah. just about yeah. how, how the skating world works. Right. Um, in terms of like the video game or... In, in terms of how the different decades of skating cultures uh, no, might sit yeah. by somebody that was born in 1984. Right. You know, actually, you know, when we started doing documentary, I wasn't... Obviously, I knew a lot of skateboarding. I've been a skater all my life, but I didn't you know, really understand what kind of led to different circumstances surrounding it. And I feel like the transition from, you know, vert skating in the late 80s to street skating in the early 90s is, is really interesting because I feel like, you know, the cost of, you know, street skating become popular essentially because, you know, people were seeing 
you know, these kids doing these crazy tricks on bird ramps. And then, you know, they, they'd go outside and there wouldn't be a single bird ramp available for them. So they just skate the streets instead. I feel like that really shows how skateboarding is such a super creative art form, you know, that you can pretty much trick off of anything. And it's kind of what's happening now too with like, you know, the mega ramps, you know, that are available, you know, they're, you know, the X Games and the Olympics, I, actually the Olympics won't have that, but the X Games show off, you know, mega ramps, and people skating off of those. And, you know, obviously they're not available to anyone, you know, outside of the pros. So, so yeah, that, that whole thing is kind of weird, man, with how skateboarding has kind of gone in different phases and stuff like that. But now skateboarding is so popular that kind of all of the elements of skateboarding are big all at once. You know, you kind of have your own style now. It's not like Steve Caballero in the late eighties who, um, he actually became a street skater in the early nineties and still is. Because you know he wanted to continue skateboarding, so yeah, it's it's not like that anymore. Obviously, yeah. That's a good answer, and I would uh, I kind of drew connections the whole time. You know, the Moog and the synthesizer became popular in the eighties uh, because it was more accessible to a, a musician, right? Uh, and it changed the culture of music. It changed genres of music significantly, and now we see you know there's a kid that can go on YouTube that can play guitar like an insane person and make money that way yeah. and continue, continue to just kind of collapse uh, the way the art works. So I, I kind of connected the two. I found it to be a, a really interesting part of the documentary. Uh, and it wasn't something that I was expecting. You know, I was expecting like, you know, Super Mario documentary. Oh, as that's usual. Cool, man. Yeah. So I, I, I really did appreciate that. That's awesome. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about uh, your personal Tony Hawk Pro Skater fandom. I uh, would like you to pick, you don't have to pick a number one, but you know, maybe one or two uh, of what you think might be the, the your favorite titles. Well, Tony Hawk's Underground is my favorite title, so I can pick one. Uh, that's okay. the fifth game in the franchise. Um, you know, that was the first game to have a story as well. It's definitely much more of a cult classic than the other four games, but you know, I feel like the story mode in that game was so awesome. It was probably the first sport game, if you can call it that, to have a story at all. And it's such a good story because a lot of people that work for Neversoft actually wanted to work in the film industry instead of, you know, the game industry. So they kind of had their talents going into that game, writing the script, getting it all done. I mean, the story is just crazy. And I think <laughs> the levels are so fun in the game, too. And the gameplay just works so well. You can get off your board in the game as well. I just love all those elements combined. And lastly, I think the soundtrack is extremely good for that game. Speaking of like punk is all that, that was the only Tony Hawk game to feature a no effects song. It also features another actually band on Fat Rick that it's really unknown. They're called Bracket. Do you know those guys? <laughs> Yeah, so, I did a Zoom with those guys, actually. Oh, you uh, did? Okay, so they're in that game, Tony Hawk's Underground. That was obviously my introduction to Bracket. I haven't really listened to them that much, but now with Mad Caddy's covering 2Rack 005, you know, mm -hmm. I got into them again, you know, and I was kind of like, yeah, I actually found out about that song through Tony Hawk's Underground, you know. Yeah, I slept on Bracket pretty hard. I, I knew about uh, their Fat Wreck, uh, you know, their Punkarama or Fat Wreck compilation yeah. releases. And it wasn't until I was about to zoom with them that I did a deep dive and said, wow, these guys are and just a fantastic chapter of, of Fat Rag. Oh, yeah. Uh, they are. And really nice dudes. Mm. You're watching. <laughs> uh, I'm happy that you said that. I thought that maybe you were going to be a purist and you were just going to say one or two. Uh, no, yeah. It's for me. For me personally, and it's kind of weird, and I know that it's not a fan favorite, but American Wasteland is, is probably my favorite. That might be my third favorite, too. So, And one of those reasons is the soundtrack, too. I'm sure you know that you know they had mm -hmm. pop punk bands covering you know 80s hardcore punk songs. So, And as a person that came from pop punk roots, uh, that was a really great moment for me. Because it, it was a yeah. moment to say, like, see, Taking Back Sunday has good roots. They're not just big pussies. <laughs> yeah, you know, obviously I can't, I come from pop punk too and to hear Gerard Way, you know, singing Misfits, um, Astro Zombies. I mean, to me, that song out us the original in every way. I mean, I'm sure nobody agrees with me, but I feel like my chemical romance did an excellent job covering Misfits. And then you got, actually, I was actually asked by someone to pick my favorite songs for 
from the Tony Hawk games. And my number one was actually saves the day Sonic Reducer because I just applaud the effort of you have this pop punk band, most important pop punk band, one of them at least of the late 90s, covering a song by Dead Boys. I mean, that's just mind blowing, you know. That's great. And you kind of answered uh, two of my questions, which is going to make this interview short and sweet, but. Oh, okay. uh, which is maybe good for clicks. I don't know how this shit works, but uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to talk about your favorite song or songs from the series. And I wanted to talk to you about any artists that you had never listened to uh, prior. And you had kind of answered both of those for me. Well, I have a couple more for sure. I mean, if we come to artists that I haven't listened to prior, I mean, there's so many of them. I should mention Mill and Colin though, because, you know, I think that's kind of unique in a way that, they're probably the most successful punk band to ever come out of Sweden internationally, which is where I'm from, you know, Mm -hmm. and, you know, and then I found out about it through the video game. And it's kind of crazy for me to think that, wow, I wouldn't know if this huge Swedish band, like (laughs) I actually found out about it through, you know, an American video game. So, you know, and Mill and Collar, they're one of my favorites too, but Goldfinger as well, you know, that's, I found out about it through the Tony Hawk games. They're the reason I started playing the trumpet and, Racket as well. I mean, I could go on forever about bands I found out through the Tony Hawk games. I won't have the same experience with the new Tony Hawk games, sadly, because I I do know a lot of the bands beforehand. But there was one or two bands that I found out now through the soundtrack for sure. That's fantastic. And uh, I find that really ironic. I was a huge Million Colin fan and was excited when they were on the game. And I'm like some kid in Nebraska. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, dude. That's amazing. Uh, for me, uh, and this kind of opens up another conversation I wanted to have about the music of Tony Hogg, uh, was the Dell, the funky homo sapiens song. Oh yeah. If Wash you yourself. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I think it, yeah, it is called if you must, yeah. but I, I also just kind of wanted to discuss the moment that, uh, the culture, and I think Chad Muska had a lot to do with it, uh, where the soundtrack which was so punk rock heavy, opened up to hip hop and other uh, other styles of music. And of course, throughout the franchise, uh, this continued to happen. Yeah. Uh, the the changing point for me, and, and I'll never forget it, you know, I was walking in my car like 10 years ago in a parking garage, there were some kids skating and vaping and listening to rap music. And I was like, do you kids like lag wagon? And they looked at me like I was a fucking alien. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> really. Yeah, uh, but the music is, is has certainly you know shifted a, a little bit more towards hip hop. I think, yeah, uh, in a big way. But when you're looking at the franchise as a whole, I, I think it's a an amazing discography. Oh yeah, and the hip hop songs too. I mean, you know, I think they actually. I mean, the the soundtrack that kind of never saw for looking out to featuring was music that was featured in the the, the skate videos. You know, and Chad Muska obviously had a lot of rap in his skate videos, you know, and hip hop, you know, the shorties, Fulfill the Dream. So I think, you know, the songs they picked weren't like hip hop on the radio. They were actually not that mainstream. You know, you had Del Defunco with Sapien. You had, I guess, you know, Bus Driver for Tony Hawk's Underground. You, they had a lot of unknown acts, even, you know, Muska beats, you know, Chad Muska's own, you know, mm-hmm. kind of solo career thing which was awesome. So I think, you know, even with hip hop, you know, they picked so good songs. And I think even people like me who at that time didn't enjoy hip hop at all, we were kind of, we were really into it by the time we got out of it, you know, with, I mean, it's crazy to think that Turn Up Scare 4 was actually my introduction to NWA as well and Public Enemy, you know, that's just crazy to think about. That that was actually, yeah. Hmm. Well, there you go. Uh, you know, Tony Hawk uh, as a game, the soundtrack to Tony Hawk was its own kind of punkorama for me. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the epitaph compilations were what really introduced me to a whole bunch of punk rock bands. Uh, yeah. As far as rap, I guess I watched a lot of MTV when I was a fourth grader. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, uh, next I wanted to talk about a, a go to level. I, I was going to start. Yeah. Uh, with just Tony Hawk 1 first warehouse level uh first discovered that you could uh grind on on those ceiling uh i don't know i don't even know what to call them 
the bars on the ceiling above the uh, the half pipe on Tony. Oh Arden. yeah, yeah, right. So it wasn't the warehouse level; it was the skate park level. Sorry. Yeah, no, that uh, was the, that was the that was the Chicago. They you called go. it for some reason. Yeah. But it actually, it's called Skate Park in Tony Hawk 1. And then in Tony Hawk American Wasteland, they call it Chicago for some reason. Yeah. There you go. So, uh, I'm not sure if... I think he had his tenure and he didn't give a fuck anymore. But my high school art teacher was our, also our high school video production teacher. And we would go in a video production room and we would play Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 pretty much all day. So, and we had a camcorder that the, the school owned set up and pointed at a window. So we knew if he was coming, we had a, a broken v- VCR that we would put the PlayStation mm-hmm. inside of. So all we had to do is turn off the TV and hide the controllers. And oh, wow. so it became, I think around my junior or senior year, it became the thing it was that someone was going to go completely around that entire level and then ramp up and get uh, above the half pipe on those bars. Yeah. And then back into the pool and complete an entire rotation of the game. And I, I want to say that we did it. I don't think that we did. Uh, but God, what a bunch of shitty high school kids. We didn't do anything. <laughs> no, I mean, man, I mean, I played a lot of Tony Hawk in my high school years too, for sure. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm much younger than you. So those games weren't as popular when I was in high school, but I do remember goofing around too. My, I mean, obviously we had computers, so I would, you know, sit on my PC and kind of play Tony Hawk's Underground all day. Well, yeah. It was super awesome, man. Um, but my go-to level in Tony Hawk 2, actually speaking of, is probably the airport level in Tony Hawk 3. I think that's the most fun because you kind of it's kind of only downhill level in the Tony Hawk games that a lot would kind of go, you know, back up again once you're down because, you know, the rails kind of connect with each other really well. So I think that's my favorite level. And then if we just speak about Tony Hawk 1, it's definitely San Francisco, which streets, you know, which finally I'm so glad they're remaking a new Tony Hawk game because that level has never been remastered in any game, in any Tony Hawk game. And now they're finally doing it. And that's just such an underrated level. It's just so epic when you get the secret tape, you kind of jump from this, you know, high building, through the glass and you do 900 and there you get secret tape. It's just so awesome. Hell yeah. No, very good answer. Uh, do you have a, a go-to skater when you play the game? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I always pick Tony Hawk, but apart from him, I guess it's Chad Musk or Rodney Mullen, really. Um, if I want to beat the career mode, I, I pick Jamie Thomas because he always had the best grind stats. Uh, I think that's something that even he acknowledged too. Like he said that, well, the Neurosoft developers liked him so much that they actually, like, you know, had his character have good stats, you know, like better stats than <laughs> Tony in some aspects. So that, that's pretty funny, actually. <laughs> I played Rooney Glifberg a lot because he, because I think as like a, like a punk rock, like late 90s guy mm-hmm. growing up in, in super religious Bible Belt country, the Christ air just seemed really funny to us. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think and, of and so, I got so used to that move and uh, that character that I just kind of kept playing as him as the series came on. I don't know anything about him. I know that maybe he's not from America. No, he's actually Scandinavian. He's from Denmark, but okay. You know, I do. I do remember. I do remember liking him quite a bit. And you know, I was doing the game game manuals as a kid, obviously, and I saw that he was from Denmark, and that, that was pretty cool. You know, like you know, so close to where I where I'm from. So, but. But yeah, I'm, I mean, my go-to was still Chad Muska for sure. Yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. Uh, damn. Well, we plowed through that. <laughs> That's nice. uh, let's talk a little bit about the production of the documentary. Uh, yeah. well, did you do this as any sort of a DIY approach? Did this kind of snowball into being as big as it was? Or did you know going right into it that it was going to be a full production with everybody on board? No, we didn't really know. I mean... You know, so Ralph D'Amato, who, um, who is producer of the film, had seen my YouTube videos on the Tony Hawk Scare Games. And that's kind of how we got in touch. And we, you know, I was getting into filmmaking at that time. It was kind of my last year of high school, I think. And um, and we wanted to do a Tony Hawk's Pro Skater documentary. So he actually allowed me to pitch the film to Tony, which was super cool. And he agreed to it immediately because you know, uh, Ralph D'Amato's name was attached to the project. So he gave it a lot of professionalism. 
but yeah, man, it was, uh, I mean, when we started out the film, I don't think we really expected anything from it, you know, at best, probably like some, you know, we would self distribute it and we would have all the pros and we'd do it in a year, but you know, it took three years to make the film because, you know, we, we had so much in juice. We kind of changed the main plot of the film halfway through the production, which was really good. I mean, like you said, we, we focus a lot on the skaters, you know, in the original vision we had for the film, we only wanted to cover each game, like, like, you know, a video game documentary, like just about video games and like each game from one to nine or whatever. But then as I did an interview, I kind of realized that, wow, you know, the skaters have such an amazing story to tell about like their experience going in. And they rarely speak about it in interviews too, because they ra- they rarely get asked about those things. Cause you know, they're not interviewed by the game magazines, you know, they're interviewed by Slappies or uh Thrasher, Transworld, you know, and, and they're not interested in talking about video games. So I feel like yeah. that, that was the best part of the film actually, that we got the skaters kind of open up about their experience with Tony Oxford Skater, you know. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it, it, it was something that I uh, wasn't expecting when I when I pressed play, and, and definitely something I think that is going to make this documentary uh, have a lot of staying power. And you know, that kind of speaks for uh, the, for the platform itself. Uh, I, I mean, they were able to take music, skating, culture, just adolescence, uh, and, and you know, video game nerd them and push them all together. Which is just yeah. I mean, it's the only video game that has ever done that. I think you know. I mean, it's not like kids that played Street Fighter in the '90s went out and you know became Street Fighters. Luckily, but you know, it's you know <laughs> something like that. You know, they can compare it with. So yeah. Oh, fantastic! Uh, I was going to ask how you felt because I have my own opinions about uh, you know uh, the the jackass. Uh, show and, and movie series that had a, a direct impact on skating as well uh to the result that bam margera himself was added to the sh- to the game yeah yeah i mean it was hugely popular you know and i mean i think it's i i like jackass i think it's fun you know i i definitely like their kind of origins in a big brother magazine too so i <laughs> think in that way they were kind of connected with skate and culture all along yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of people complain about the whole kind of jackass direction that the video games took too. you know, with Tony Hawk's mm-hmm. Underground 2, especially where he was kind of the lead. But, you know, I, you know, I really think that they weren't really doing anything but kind of trying to really use the trends to their advantage, you know. And, you know, they had Bam Margera, who was essentially like almost bigger than Tony Hawk at the peak at of Jackass. Point. Yeah, at that point, you know, with Jackass, the movie one, two, I mean, he was... You know, they were, I mean, it's crazy to think about how how big those guys were, because, you know, anytime you talk about a jackass films, people know what you're what you're talking about. You know, even my parents know what jackass is, you know, so that, and they know Johnny Knoxville, too. And that's just crazy. So, I mean, I, I love jackass. I can't wait for the fourth movie that's finally coming out next year, I hope. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. I thought it was an interesting time. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Very unique time, too, you know skateboarding had just become cool again i, I think in a lot of circles as well yeah uh, and, and jackass was just kind of an icing on that that wouldn't let go to the skating oh, yeah. side even as people kind of maybe forgot about the franchise itself yeah cool um do you have any other upcoming projects uh do you have anything else that you want to accomplish uh, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, I do have a lot of documentaries in development right now. Nothing that I can disclose yet. But, you know, apart from making documentaries, I also make a lot of, like, fiction. So I'm working on a new short film right now. It's a sci-fi. My previous short film, The Outsider, it, which is based on a story by H.P. Lovecraft, this very legendary horror author, um, that actually got picked up for distribution and um, and both for DVD and actually online. And it, it's got pretty successful. So because of that, I'm able to fund my next short film, which is going to kind of be this, I think, epic sci-fi film. So, and hopefully that'll, you know, develop and I'll be able to make features with fiction as well, not just documentaries, but I love making documentaries too, man. I mean, obviously I never planned to make documentaries, but kind of, you know, coming in there and starting off, you know, this is my first feature film, you know, pretending I'm Superman and kind of starting off with that. It feels really good, man. Cause you know, when you start making films, that's when you really realize how many films that like never get, I don't want to say anywhere, but like 
you don't never get any proper distribution, never get, you know, any proper reviews, never get any attention or anything like that. You realize, you realize that that's like 90% of all films ever made probably. So, mm-hmm. you know, by that time, I mean, I guess your bar becomes lower and you're like, wow, actually like made a film that people actually saw and enjoyed. And I, that's just crazy. You know, that, that whole thought is insane. So I hope I can continue that trend for sure. Yeah. Absolutely. And I wish you the best. Uh, not, you. not to rewind super far, but you were talking about showing uh, Ralph your YouTube videos. Yeah. Can you elaborate on, on what is that? Yeah, no, I was doing a lot of like YouTube videos on Tony Hawk Pro Skater, uh, mainly like, you know, walkthroughs, kind of the things that people do now, but like with commentary. And I did an amateur documentary on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, uh, which he saw. And he like really appreciated the attention to detail in that. It's still up on YouTube if you ever want to check it out. It's, I mean, some people are looking at that now and going like, oh, wow, that that's actually like the kind of prequel to, you know, so pretending I was was it, was it PC heavy? Uh, what do you mean? Like political? Like correct? were you playing on the PC a lot? Oh, the PC. Uh, yeah, I was playing I was playing Tony Hawk's Underground on the PC a lot, Pro especially. There, there were like a couple of mods for the game that I would play. And then... Towards the end of my YouTube, I mean, it was summer career, but my YouTube kind of life, you know, Tony Hawk Scary 5 was coming out. So I did a lot of videos covering that as well. I absolutely watched a whole bunch of that shit. And I totally recognize your voice when we started talking. I didn't no know where way. I was from. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, no uh, I'm assuming uh, Cinemassacre or Console Wars, those two video game channels. I'm assuming that they suggested you to me in some algorithmic way because i totally just completely destroyed hours of my life watching watching you play that game so small world That's awesome yeah small <laughs> world man i was known as ice for forever you can check it out the i mean the the videos are still up so yeah yeah and you know i started this interview by complaining to you about my daughter watching other kids play with toys on youtube and here i yeah. was watching another person play a video game <laughs> yeah, yeah i mean it's not that much difference you know <laughs> Well, there you go. Uh, really appreciate you giving me the time. I know you're staying up late in Sweden to talk to me today, waiting for me to get off work. So I, I really appreciate that. And uh, everybody needs to make sure to check out the uh, Pretending I'm a Superman documentary for Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Excellent film. Very good job. And thank you for giving me the time today. Thank you too, man. It was great being here. And yeah, like like I said, don't forget to check out Pretending I'm Superman. It's available on iTunes, YouTube, Amazon Prime, etc. Yeah, I mean, thanks for having me, man. It was it was a pleasure talking to you, man. I hope to see you soon.